Matthew 1, verses 22 and 23. Now all this was done that it might be fulfilled which was spoken of the Lord by the prophet, saying, Behold, a virgin shall be with child, and shall bring forth a son, and they shall call his name Emmanuel, which being interpreted is God with us. As we start to uh, celebrate the season, go tell it on the mountain. And yes, we start with the chorus. shows me the next slide and so sometimes I don't remember to click yours up there. Our scripture reading this morning is found in Isaiah chapter 9 verses 2 through 7. Isaiah chapter 9 verses 2 and following. The people who walk in darkness will see a great light. Those who live in a dark land the light will shine on them. You shall multiply the nation, you shall increase their gladness they will be glad in your presence. They will, as with the gladness of, hardness, of harvest, as men rejoice when they divide the spoil. For you shall break the yoke of their burden and the staff on their shoulders, the rod of their oppressor as at the battle of Midian. For every boot of the booted warrior in the battle tumult and cloak rolled in blood will be for burning, fuel for the fire. For a child will be born to us, a son will be given to us, and the government will rest on his shoulders, and his name will be called Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, Eternal Father, Prince of Peace. There will be no end to the increase of his government or of peace on the throne of David and over his kingdom, to establish it and to uphold it with justice and righteousness from then on and forevermore. The zeal of the Lord of hosts will accomplish this. Amen. O oh, little town of Bethlehem, as we continue in song this morning. Keep. Mm -hmm. 
praises sing to God the King and peace to men on earth. How silently, how silently the wondrous gift is given. So God imparts to human hearts the blessing. If you would take your bulletins, uh, we'll make mention of the announcements found therein. One that I don't believe is in your uh, bulletin concerns Christmas cards. This year, because of COVID, uh, we're going to request your help with Christmas cards for one another. If you bring cards in, please paste them, place them on their nameplate on the table in the back. Uh, that way we'll have less hands touching the envelope. So our postman has not retired, uh, but we're giving him the season off uh, in the name of not spreading things to him or others. Uh, so if you would be so kind, if you have cards for one another, place them on the table in the back under the missions board, and then uh, come Christmas time, you can collect those that have your name on it, and um, we'll keep serving one another in that regard. Uh, tonight, this afternoon, 4.30, we're going to have a Christmas program run through. Did I say 4.30? I meant 4.15. Hint, hint, wink, wink, nod, nod. Uh, we need you here to start at 4.30 to do a walk through the program. Uh, looking forward to that evening service tonight downstairs at 6 o'clock as we continue our study in the book of, Ac of Acts. Uh, today we're collecting a special love offering for Wayne and Sandy Shatney, our NRBFC representatives. Uh, as we've explained, we had as a fellowship, we had to lower their pay uh, by five grand. And then we are about 2,500 shy on the year because the, we've not had any conferences. And between the two conference offerings, we typically see that come in pretty faithfully around that number, give or take. Um, it leaves us where we can't pay the Shatneys, probably not even what we've agreed to pay them. And again, that was based on a $5,000 pay cut. And then next year is looking at more than that. Most likely, that's the most likely scenario. So if you would like to give uh, to help the Shatneys out in this season, there's a basket in the back. Uh, it's the same place last week's Deacons Fund offering was placed. Uh, so you'll know the basket when you see it. And uh, we thank you in advance uh, for helping them in that regard. If you would like to commit to support a missionary for 2021 or to continue supporting your missionary into 2021, please see Jane Kingston for that. Long before my time, they did what Pastor Branham called privatizing the missions giving, uh, where people gave to a particular missionary by name. Uh, we have kind of a hybrid now. Some folks, I'm one of them, we just give to missions at our house. Uh, they can use it where they need it. Uh, some of our folks do that for one particular missionary. Uh, that can be a wonderful thing, especially if you create a, and maintain a relationship with that missionary and uh, communicate with them. That's a wonderful thing. It gives us one more conduit uh, to hear from them and for them to hear from us and to know that they're cared about. Uh, but basically, folks, I hate to use the word pledge because that sounds very PBS-like and not very church-like, but people commit uh, by faith that they will support their missionary by the month uh, typically, those are in 40 or $50 increments for the month. Uh, but uh, if you're not supporting missions and you'd like to, uh, whether by name or just in, in general, uh, see Jean about that. She'll help you sort that out, and we'd be glad to have your help. Uh, we've had uh, a little setback, and we're at present. Uh, we, we're really at a place where, where our, our missions giving is the lowest it's been in a very long time. 
and we're twenty dollars a month below what we committed to our missionaries so we need that help but we'd like to expand from there so if you'd like to help in that regard we'd be glad to have it and please do see Jean about that this week at Tuesday morning at 10 will be ladies Bible study it's their Christmas party uh, special business meeting Thursday night uh, to vote in next year's officers and uh, we look forward to that uh, Pilgrim homeschoolers here Friday at 10 Saturday at noon it's a kids Christmas party uh, bring three dollars a piece for pizza there's gonna be crafts and games provided at three o'clock will be the teen Christmas party that's here this year and bring a five dollar gift to exchange uh, for that gift exchange if you have no idea what to get you can never go wrong with the Dunkin Donuts gift card I hate to say it out loud but that is what the kids fight over every year if you're really stumped there's your answer that's how it works Gabe was just about ready to say amen back there I could see it coming if you could pass for a teen you'd be there I know um, on the 20th next Sunday in the evening will be our celebration of Christ's birth through verse and song uh, do invite your friends and family explain it to them tell them about how the pews are roped off tell them they need to wear their mask they're supposed to wear it all the time but most certainly in the comings and the goings we need to wear our masks and uh, we'd love to have folks here uh, but people have asked about the governor's order starting today he rolled us back to phase three uh, scene one uh, step one and what that is is we're back to 40 percent of capacity uh, we've checked with the town there's a formula for determining capacity and we're under it uh, we're under our 40 percent number we're safe uh, we're going to start counting through the christmas season just in case uh, but uh, we're we're doing our best and fortunately we can we have enough building that we can put we can have uh, take care of everybody who wants to come and uh, we're very glad for that we haven't had to have sign ups like some churches or uh, things of that nature on the 27th there will be no evening service so uh, enjoy your family uh, the evening of, of Sunday the 27th we have regular service Sunday morning the 27th but no evening service that evening and uh, please do bring poinsettias we're grateful for those that have come in already it's getting very red up here very beautiful and if you want to do those in memory of a loved one please do and give us a note so we know uh, who to remember uh, when we get closer to Christmas time you see nursery and children's church schedules and we're so grateful for folks in their ministry downstairs and uh, to our families up here now special music at this time margaret wood is going to come and minister in song
for poor ornery people like you and like I. I wonder as I wander out under the sky. Thank you, Margaret. Children are dismissed to junior church at this time. Uh, if you know your music history, if you know your Americana, you'll know that we sang two Negro spirituals. This, well, we had two Negro spirituals this morning, Go Tell It on the Mountain, and then uh, special music, I Wander As I Wander. Um, Margaret got me again. Her voice sounds a lot like my mom's, and she has the same taste in music as my mom, and that was one of mom's Christmas go-to, so um, if I get a little misty, you know why. Uh, but it's a beautiful, beautiful song. Think about it. It's a contribution of slaves to America. Uh, it's a contribution of our brothers and sisters in Christ who were enslaved to America. And uh, it's really a wonderful, beautiful thing if you think about it. It's a unique style, uh, it's a unique approach, and it's loving of our Savior. Uh, I've always enjoyed them. Uh, most of the spirituals I've ever heard, I thoroughly enjoyed. And uh, those were two of the finest this morning about the Christmas season. Now, um, forgive me, I've got to do a little shuffling here. Because I hit the wrong button. Okay. Uh, this morning, prophetic proofs that Jesus is the Christ. I typically don't do a Christmas message this long before Christmas. Uh, I've never done a Christmas message this long before Christmas. Maybe I have a mind that for once we need more Christmas in our life and we need to spend more time here. I think it's a good way uh, kind of to see this year out is to spend at least a couple weeks talking about our Savior and uh, his birth and his purpose. Uh, I think we need to start talking as we ring in the new year. I think we need to start being kind of realistic, frankly. And um, I think sometimes we realize some things. Sometimes we go through a hardship and we say to ourselves, this hardship is temporary. All I have to do is to get to the other side of it. My first year of teaching, people told me the goal of your first year of teaching is to make it to your second year. That's the goal. I think there needs to be more goals than that, but I knew what they were saying. Survive. You know, uh, one of my favorite books about teaching is entitled Making It Till Friday. Um, by the way, Making It Till Friday does nothing for a preacher. You know, that's where it starts in earnest. Uh, but anyway, uh, the, the point is sometimes we see a trial that we're in, and we think of that trial as something I just, I need to survive it. It's temporary. I'll get to the other side. And so if I had a nickel for all the people who have said, whether Facebook meme, chain email, in person, I can't wait to put 2020 behind me. You remember how we started 2020? Every preacher in America had 2020 in terms of seeing clearly or vision. My title, I looked it up, was seeing clearly in 2020. I knew I did something like that. Uh, but pastors all over America were excited. You know, hey, 2020, it's catchy. Let's talk about vision. Let's talk about how we see things. And, and so we hit 2020, oh boy. And then COVID. And then riots. And then elections. And a mess. And so people are saying, oh, I can't wait to put 2020 behind me. Dear friend, I hate to break it to you, but what basis do you have that 2021 isn't going to be worse? So back to the illustration of I just have to survive a thing. I just have to get to the other side of it or I can handle this because it's temporary and relief is in sight. Uh, Pastor Shatney, when, when we go to the Shatneys at a holiday or whatever, when there's a crowd, uh, my wife and I stay in his study. Uh, he's got a desk and a bed, and so that's our room. I like it. I like it because there's always good books in there. Uh, I like it because, you know, he's got a lot of his outdoor stuff there. And mostly I like it because the bed's comfortable. But he has a little sign on the side of a uh, uh, filing cabinet that says, due to um, financial cutbacks, the light of the, at the end of the tunnel has been extinguished until further notice. Well, you know, 
perhaps we need to start thinking that this isn't something that's going to change as we sing all the anxiety on New Year's Eve. And if that's the case, may I suggest to you, and I'm getting way ahead of myself because this is really the introduction to my sermon for three weeks from now. Maybe we need to start thinking about being in shape for it and handling it better and figuring it out and pleasing the Lord and how we handle things. Um, so there you have it. That's the gist of our preaching at the beginning of January is, hey, uh, we need to please the Lord. Uh, sometimes we realize, sometimes I realize physically, you know, this is a new reality. I need to deal with this pain or uh, alongside it, I need to strengthen something. I need to get in shape in a way that's going to keep this from happening or being as bad when it happens. This is what I need to deal with now. And so we've got to meet it head on. But at the end of this year, I think it's very well for us to celebrate our Savior. It's always good for us, but I think it's particularly good for us at the end of this difficult year, uh, with all that's gone on, with all that's going in our, on in our world, to take a little extra time to look at the Word of God, to look at the promise of the Christ. Uh, people, I, I've heard all kinds of arguments against modern translations one of the arguments that people really hang on is they don't like modern translations because they refer to Jesus as the Christ, not just as Christ. Well, we typically say the Messiah, don't we? Christ is just the Greek form of the Hebrew word Messiah. That's all. That means he holds an office and he is the Christ. It's more accurate, it's true to the text, we're not taking a word out, there is a definite article there. And it doesn't make him just some idea, it makes him a particular person who has been prophesied throughout history to come, throughout Israel's history, was the promised Messiah, the Deliverer. And Jews today trip up, many of them, I delight in Jewish Christians, uh, how, what a wonderful group of people they are, uh, but so many get tripped up with the idea of a political Messiah. In the New Testament, in the beginning of the Gospels, people were tripped up over Jesus and the Jesus story because they had this picture of Messiah that was throne and scepter, crown and kingdom. It was political. He's going to deliver us from the Romans. He's going to empower us again. We're going to be a, a, a self-determined nation and we're going to be in charge of the reason. And we're going to be like nothing we've ever been before. Even the disciples thought that was happening. Let us sit on your right hand and on your left. But the fact of the matter is, the prophecies, when we read them carefully, were the cross first, and then later, as it turns out, quite a bit later, the crown. And so, we're going to look at prophecy today. We're going to begin to look at prophecy today. I think we're going to end up spilling into next week pretty easily. Uh, prophecies that prove that Jesus is truly the promised one, the Messiah. Prophecies that show the wonderful correlation and dovetailing of Old Testament with New Testament and how perfectly uh, they interlock with each other and interact with each other. Uh, the New Testament is not a tack on. The New Testament is, is not a, a um, reaction and, and a change. Hey, listen, Israel rejected Jesus and so now we have to change the, the whole way God deals with the world. Well, that happened, but that's not because God didn't have it planned that way from ages past. Uh, we know that he's had a plan all along. So let's have a word of prayer, and then let's start talking about prophecies of our Savior. Father, thank you for your word, and thank you for your spirit. Thank you, Lord, that in a world of confusing and conflicting reports and instructions and worldviews, we have the word of God. We have in writing what you want us to know, what you want us to believe, and how you want us to live. Dear Lord, that we would hold it precious, that we would hold it high, that we would hold it in high esteem and that we would obey its every command. And that we would strive to know it better, to more, become more like our Savior because we spent our time in the book that's all about Him from beginning to end. Thank you, Lord, that the old is in the new, con or the, old is in, the new is in the old contained and the old is in the new explained. And we thank you, Lord, so much for that truth. And we pray, Lord, as we look at it, that it would become clear and plain to us this hour in Jesus' name. Never quote poetry in prayers. Genesis chapter 3, verse 15. Eh. 
fiddle. I needed to put animations in here uh, to make this what it needed to be. So don't read the bottom before we've talked about the top. I know I can trust you for that. <laughs> Not for a minute. You're already down there, I can tell. That's how these things work. I would have done it too. Uh, the first mention of the second, com second coming of Messiah Jesus is actually given to Satan in Genesis 3.15. Genesis chapter 3 in verse 1 is where sin enters. Satan, as a serpent comes to Eve, starts to question what has God said? What did God say about this? And he uses very clever half-truths and misleading things that are technically true but completely deceptive. He knows, God knows that in the day you eat thereof, you'll be like the gods, small g, discerning or knowing good from evil. Well, that's true. He didn't tell them it would be the worst knowledge they ever came into and that would wreck humankind. Uh, God had warned them, don't touch it, don't, or don't eat it. And Adam had actually said to his wife, don't touch it, hon. Leave it right alone. Stay away from it. Same as we tell our kids, really. Um, you know, stay a good ways back. We give a little buffer between where the command is and where the pain hurts from them, you know, going further than they ought to, into the road or towards the wood stove, etc. And so to Gen in Genesis 3.15, the Lord is speaking to Satan after the fall of man. And I will put enmity between you and the woman, and between your seed and her seed. He shall bruise you on the head, and you shall bruise him on the heel. Literally, the, the wording here is literally, we would say, I'm declaring war between you and the woman. And this just isn't about ladies hating snakes. It's much more than that. It's about Satan. And it's about the offspring of Satan, which... John 8, the Lord describes as those who follow Satan. You are of your father, the devil, and you do as he does. He was a liar from the beginning, the father of lies. You're deceptive because you're his kids. And so it's not biological as it is with Eve, uh, but it is ideological as those who follow Satan's bidding, who see the world the way he does, who want the sin that he wants. They're of their father, the devil. I am declaring war between you and the woman, between the devil and his followers, and humankind, the offspring of Eve. Uh, this war would continue down their family's tree. The NIV says between your offspring and hers. Uh, again, the offspring of the certain, according to John Walford, includes demons and anyone serving his kingdom of darkness, those whose father is the devil, John 8, 44. Uh, Jesus lays it out. They were getting after him because he was talking about doing the will of his father. He pointed a finger at them and said, you're doing the will of your father, the devil. And uh, he was very pointed in saying the thing like that to them. Note the progression of the text. And I will put enmity between you and the woman. That is immediate present and it's ongoing. It's, it's the wording of it in the Hebrew is, it's now and for as far as the eye can see into the future immediate and ongoing. I will put enmity between you and the woman. It'll start now and it's going to keep on. Between your seed and her seed, this is going to go into future generations. You know about the Hatfields and the McCoys? Um, I'm a Hoosier. I'm a Hoosier by probably about five or six miles. Oh, that's how far my hometown is from the Kentucky border. I'm proud of every one of those miles. It, it's born in you. It, you know, you got Hoosier red in your in your blood in your veins and you're supposed to tell Kentuckian jokes that they, they tell you that as you leave the hospital that's your that's your life's right is to tell Kentuckian jokes uh, but Kentuckians are hillbillies and among those hillbillies famously the Hatfields and the McCoys uh, who fought each other tooth and nail and they they passed a blood feud from generation to generation pretty much done now by the way uh, but between the woman and the serpent it was going to just keep on going that conflict would always be there some of our folks go into the secular workplace and they put up with hardships and persecution because they stand for Christ and they don't go along with the crowd. Their language is different, their stories are different, their repetition of things is different, their manner of handling things, the honesty with which they do their work is different. And people don't like that kind of different, especially if they feel bad about themselves because somebody else in the same workforce is handling things. I once worked at a horrible place and did a horrible job. I did it with one other man. He hated me because I could go through the horrible without cussing and swearing a blue streak, and that was his means of coping, quote unquote. 
he didn't like that I wouldn't get angry with him uh, or alongside him uh, like he wanted. Uh, but future generations. And then specific future event. He will bruise you on the head and you shall bruise him on the heel. That's talking about something specific that was yet future to them there. Um, our view. This verse includes a promise that one day the seed of Satan will bring a non-fatal blow to the seed of the woman, bruise his heel. That's the cross. Now, the cross was the killing of Jesus Christ. One would think that that would truly be fatal, not non-fatal. But three days later, we knew better, didn't we? Uh, the cross was a horrible thing. And the cross was a wonderful thing. The whole book of Galatians is about glorying in the cross. God loved me enough that he sent his son to die in my place. His son his one and only Son, His Son who had been from the beginning of the world, as we'll see in a little bit, before the beginning of the world, we'll see in a little bit in Micah chapter 5. This Son, He gave up for me. Uh, we've had conversations uh, not that long ago with some folks about whether there were other worlds. Have you noticed all the, the media attention to Area 51 and to things about you know uh, UFOs and aliens and so forth, uh, it's it's all around us, and uh, you know there's there's all these stories, etc. And people ask legitimate questions: Could there be? I think of it even as I stand out and I look at the stars, and they just go on further than my eye can see, and I know it, and I can't begin to count those stars. Does God have another world somewhere? Has He had another world somewhere? By the way, not only does He have an infinite galaxy. He has infinity of time because he has always been. He had no beginning. He has always been. So for time eternal in the past, did he have another world? He's God. He could have. But keep thinking it through. For this world, he gave his only son. There's nothing that compares to that. And I can't imagine that he could have done it another time. And I know for a fact he didn't have another son. He told me that. And I found him completely trustworthy. And so I think it's unique. I, I think humankind, I think earth is exceptional in the universe. Humankind is exceptional on earth. And God sent his son for us. What an amazing thing. But what a humbling thing. And what a wonderful thing all at once. Bruce's heel. That's the cross. What a picture. The serpent has just been told that he's no longer, he and his offspring are not going to have legs anymore. And so the snake is down there. I've said it often. I, I remember as a kid, we used to do camp in the Sierra Nevadas in California. And we would do our own church camp. And everybody had to watch a video about snake bite. There are several poisonous snakes in California. There's two different, I think there's two different rattlesnake uh, species out there. But there's all kinds of poisonous snakes there. I was really excited to be in the woods in northern New Hampshire because there are no poisonous snakes in the woods of north, northern New Hampshire. I think that's living. That's okay by me. I'm good with that. But I was petrified as a young kid going to camp, watching these videos where people would get snake bit. Either they're climbing up something, they get bit on the arm, or typically they get bit in the lower leg. And, you know, there's these kits that would help suck the venom out. They'd cut the vein, you know, cut into the vein a little above that and suck the venom out. Or maybe people would do that with their mouth. And I was completely scared of this. But you know what? I have never seen anybody wear a snake hat or a snake scarf or a snake shirt. They wear snake boots. The heel, the lower leg, that's what's susceptible to a critter that has no legs of its own. That's what we worry about. Although one time I was climbing up a sand dune, scrambling from one bit of tumbleweed to the next in, uh, down near Santa Cruz, California, and I grabbed a hold of a bush, and when I grabbed that bush, I couldn't see it yet, but I heard a very distinctive rattle coming from the other side of that bush. And I let go, and I went down that sandy bank as fast as gravity would take me, and I didn't try going back up again all week. That, that rattle puts the fear in you, and that's that. Uh, but he will bruise your heel, or you will bruise his heel. The seed of Satan will bruise the heel of the seed of, of Eve. 
And so this is the cross. And Satan celebrated, but it was short-lived. And the seed of the woman will bring a fatal blow to the seed of Satan. That is, he will bruise his head. How do you kill a snake? You deal with its head. Um, went to camp. The only other time I saw a rattlesnake in camp, it was already dead. The man that was leading us on a, on a pack horse trip uh, was way up front, and he cut the snake's head off. And I didn't even see the snake until he picked it up headless, and my horse was not too happy with that. And I had a very hard time settling it back down. Uh, but to kill a snake, you take its head. And that is a permanent blow to the snake. He doesn't come back from that. You could start at the other end, and you're going to have some problems, but you start at the head, and it's done. And so, bruising the head. May I suggest to you that that's the resurrection. When Jesus raised from the dead, that was final, complete, and total victory. Uh, 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verses 55 through 58. O death, where is your victory? O death, where is your sting? The sting of death is sin, and the power of sin is the law. But thanks be to God who gives us the victory through our Lord Jesus Christ. Therefore, my beloved brethren, be steadfast and immovable, always abounding in the work of the Lord, knowing that your toil is not in vain in the Lord. You want to have a delightful conversation, ask Hector what that verse means to him sometime. It's precious to my brother. It's precious to me. O oh, death, where are your sting? O oh, grave, where's your victory? Jesus has given us complete victory over sin and death in the grave by his death and by his resurrection. And so it's a complete difference in how we see the world with that basis. So the first mention was Genesis chapter 3 and verse 15. The head and the heel. The relationship between Eve's descendants and Satan's descendants slash followers. Uh, there are many other mentions in the Old Testament. Uh, some have said that the number of Old Testament prophecies that Jesus fulfilled numbers in the hundreds. I haven't done that math. I haven't done that homework. I'll say this, there's an awful lot of them. And our purpose even now and next week, if we, do, if we have to spill over, is to look at the high points of these, uh, the, the most important of them. Why do these prophecies matter? Well, God has had a plan all along. Salvation through Jesus Christ, the cross, is not God's plan B. He had it planned. Ephesians 1 told, tells me that he had chosen me in him before the foundation of the world. And so Jesus was going to die for us before Adam and Eve were created. God had it planned. Why would he let such a thing happen? Why would he do such a thing? Without it, we would never know the mercy of God. Without it, we would never understand or, per, or even get our head remotely around the idea of the forgiveness of God. Without the cross, we would have no idea of the depths of the grace of God. It had to happen. That's how we know him. Uh, our uh, professor, Dr. Carter, uh, at my alma mater, uh, used to every year uh, talk to students about dominion. God created Adam and Eve, and he set them in the garden, and he gave them dominion over the earth. He told them that. He used that word. That word means that, that they had control over all of the animals, over all of the growing things that had roots, the fish and the, and, and the birds and everything, man had dominion over it. He was a caretaker over it, and he could use it as he thought best. He was given that dominion. It's a pretty amazing thing. And so giving that to him, uh, leaving him in that position, he has a plan. And he tested him. So in dominion, man is, is up here. He's innocent. He has not sinned yet. He's not righteous. He's not perfect. It's not that he can't sin. It's not that he's holy like God and has an incapacity for sin. He's innocent. He hasn't sinned yet. That baby just comes out of the womb. Hasn't sinned yet. Innocence. That's the closest that we get to the Adam and Eve status at that point. And then they fell. They sinned in chapter 3. They're, they're created in chapter 2. They sin in chapter 3, and the whole world changes from that point radically and not for the better because of that sin. 
And so they're given dominion, and you think about the ability, the mental acuity of Adam to give an intelligent name to every critter that exists on the earth. And by the way, there were more of them then, not less. Real science and scripture tell us that's a pretty amazing thing. And to each of them, an intelligible name. He had the use of all of his brain. The geniuses, the smartest people we know, use a very, very small fraction of what they have up there in their skull. Uh, most people use single digits or very low double digits in terms of percentage of what they have up there. It's a very small number. Adam and Eve, they had the use of the whole thing. It was a pretty amazing thing. And so dominion and then fall, it plummets. And in the future, God gives mankind partial dominion based on technology. Look at the things we can do. It's astounding. The things that can be done medically, the things that can be done in, in terms of flight and space travel, and now all the rage is there's going to be commercial space flights. I'm not sure I want to be on any of those first flights, but they're going to do it, and it's probably going to happen pretty soon. Uh, we're hearing more, more about it all the time. It's amazing what man can do with technology. In technology, he has a partial return of his dominion. But apart from Christ, spiritually, he's still fallen, and he is at his lowest ever apart from Christ. So technology gives him partial dominion, but spiritually, he's as low as he was immediately after the fall, apart from Christ. But in Christ, and this works better with the chalkboard, in Christ, we're higher than we were where we started. Think about what man is, what saved man and woman are, apart are with Christ in their life, having trusted him. Think of our status. We are now joint heirs with Jesus Christ. We are now the sons of God. And we know that we'll be like him for we'll see him as he is. What an inheritance we have coming. We are higher than Adam and Eve because we know the forgiveness of God. We know the depth of the love of God. We know the depth of the grace and the mercy of God because of the cross. Without the cross, we wouldn't know. And so man started out so high, but save man spiritually, mentally is in a higher place spiritually because he knows the depth of God's love, his mercy, and his grace. What a thing it is. And the angels, I love the song, glory, glory is what the angels sing, and I intend to help them make the courts of heaven ring. But when it comes to my salvation, the angels fold their wings, for heaven never knew the joy that my salvation brings. What a wonderful thing it is to be forgiven, amen? What a wonderful thing it is to have a Savior, to have all of my sins left behind me buried because Christ died for every one of them. Praise the Lord for the cross. Praise the Lord for the empty tomb. Praise the Lord for our Savior. Some other uh, prophecies that need to be, needed to be fulfilled. It was said that Jesus would be descended from David. 2 Samuel chapter 7, verse 14. It was going to be, he was going to be a descendant from David. But there are some catches in that. Uh, Jeremiah and um, there we go. Jeremiah twenty two twenty eight. Is this man Coniah, who was one of the kings descended from David by way of Solomon? Is this man, Coniah, a despised and shattered jar? Or is he an undesirable vessel? Why have he and his descendants been hurled out and cast into a land that they had not known? O oh, land, 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 hear the word of the Lord. Thus says the Lord, write this man down childless, a man who will not prosper in his days. For no man of his descendants will prosper sitting on the throne of David or ruling again in Judah. Also in Jeremiah chapter 36 and verse 30, Jehoiakim, one of Coniah's ancestors, one of Solomon's descendants. Scripture says this of him in Jeremiah 36 and verse 30. Therefore thus says the Lord concerning Jehoiakim, king of Judah, 
he shall have no one to sit on the throne of David, and his dead body shall be cast out to the heat of the day and the frost of the night. I will also punish him and his descendants and his servants for their in iniquity, and I will bring on them and the inhabitants of Jerusalem and the men of Judah all the calamity that I have declared to them, but they did not listen. And so, if you will, we have King David at the top of this family tree. He had a lot of kids, but let's talk in particular about Solomon and Nathan, his two sons from, from which we, that have import to the study of Jesus. On the side of Solomon, Solomon has, made, has been given all of these promises, and 2 Samuel 7 at its outset, is clearly God talking to David about Solomon. And that is astounding by itself. I found when it came to questions of family makeup, of divorce and remarriage, I found in dealing with teenagers that when we taught the scriptures and what the scripture had to say about divorce, immediately I had kids lined up at my desk after class. Yeah, I belong to my dad, my sister belongs to my mom, they're not in their first marriage, they're not in their second marriage, they're in their third marriage, what's that make me? What am I worth? And things like that. And are they really married? Well, John 4, Jesus says to the Samaritan woman at the well, you've well said you have no husband, you've had five husbands, and the man you're with now is not your husband. So while God hates divorce, he tells us that in, in Malachi, while he hates it, he recognizes that, and he recognizes subsequent marriages. You've had five husbands. The guy you're with now is not your husband. And so God recognizes second and subsequent marriages. It's not his ideal. It's not his plan, but he recognizes them. And that brings us back to Solomon, because in Solomon, I could say to a child, I could say to a student, God blesses in second marriages and subsequent marriages. Bathsheba was not David's second or third wife. It was a longer list than that. Solomon was not David's oldest boy. I'm not even sure he was in the top ten. I didn't look it up for this morning, but he's down there a ways. But he was God's choice to sit on the throne. The second Samuel 7 spells that out. So does God bless in spite of our crazy world that's been crazy for a lot longer than we think? Oh, he sure does. Solomon's a glowing, wonderful picture of that. God can do amazing things in you. It doesn't matter where you came from. God can do a wonderful thing in you, and that's a blessing. And so praise the Lord that we have Scripture that demonstrates that to us. But Solomon was promised all these blessings, but not everything in 2 Samuel 7 was about Solomon because Solomon's throne didn't last forever, and Solomon wasn't sinless. He started out so very well. There's a whole lot of lesson in that but he failed. He started out so well when God said, I'll, give you, I'll grant you one wish. It's the closest that we get to a genie in the bottle moment in Scripture. I'll give you that one wish. What would you like? He could have asked for fabulous wealth. He could have asked for fabulous power to rule the world. He asked wisely for wisdom. And God gave that to him. And he gave him the largest borders that Israel ever had. And he gave him tremendous wealth. And because of that wealth, women started being sent to him by their fathers that were kings of outlying lands. And he just kept multiplying wives. And he had hundreds of them. If that wasn't enough trouble, they brought their false gods with them. And he allowed it. And it was a downfall for him and for Israel. From him came Jehoiakim. And we read in Jeremiah 36 that God wasn't going to bless Jehoiakim either. We read in chapter 20 that his offspring, Kaniah, uh, blew it before the Lord and God wasn't going to bless him. And so nobody from that line was going to sit on the throne. But God has made a promise in 2 Samuel 7, 14 that he's going to establish his throne forever through David's offspring. And so in Luke's genealogy of Christ, it goes backwards from Mary to her father and all the way up it goes um, I believe hers goes all the way back actually to Adam. And then in Matthew, we have the genealogy of Joseph. What we have is they have a common ancestor. That, that, that worries us a little, doesn't it? Um, common ancestry. Um, Haman at its root is an English name. Shatney is an English name. 
maybe somewhere back the family trees in all those hundreds of years, maybe somewhere my wife and I have a common ancestor. It's, it's not all that impossible at all. Uh, that could be true of many of us. That's just the nature of it. Um, Mary and Joseph had David as a common ancestor. And so God kept his word uniquely in the birth of Jesus in that while his legal father Joseph was descended from Jehoiakim and Kaniah and Solomon, all of whom had been told that their descendants wouldn't rule, but they had the dynastic legal rights. And so the legal right to the throne comes by way of Joseph, but the biological dynastic right comes through his biological mother, Mary. Isn't it amazing? We talk about Jesus as the God-man, the theanthropic being is the fancy theological word for that. And he truly was, because his father was the Holy Spirit who came upon Mary, but his mother was Mary. She was completely human. And she descended all the way down from David by way of his son, Nathan. Again, not his oldest son uh, or his most famous son at all, but God did that. And so the legal right through Joseph, the biological right through Mary, who else would that be true of? It's, it's a convoluted thing, if you will. It's a complicated thing to look at and to realize how these family trees work and how they come down and how they come back together to Joseph and Mary and eventually to Jesus, or ultimately to Jesus. But in that complicated nature of it, we realize that only Jesus qualified as Messiah. Only he could have been the perfect fulfillment. And we have to be able to look back, you know, 2020 hindsight. There's another way we could use that. Uh, 2020, huh? But hindsight's 2020. We look backwards and things make perfect sense. We can second guess one another. We, we can second guess ourselves or we can get confirmation because when we look backwards, things tend to make a whole lot more sense after they've happened than before or even as they're happening. And so with that in mind, we recognize that God worked it out so that unique to history was Jesus, Mary's firstborn son. And so, proofs of the Messiahship of Jesus. Dear friend, you need to be up to date, or read up, on these things. You need to understand, and you need to be able to, to get to the stepping stones, if you will. Genesis 3.15, Genesis 12 and 15, God's covenant with Abraham, that, where he said that in his seed, singular, all the families of the earth would be blessed. That's a reference to Christ. Uh, you go from there to 2 Samuel 7 and the Davidic covenant that we've talked about this morning. You go from there to the Psalms. You go from there to Isaiah 7 and Isaiah 9 and Isaiah 53. And you find that there's a wonderful path, stone pathway as these stepping stones bring us through the Old Testament to the cross. There are millions of Jews in our world, some of them practicing, some of them not. Many of them wonderful people clean living, committed people, spiritually minded religious people, pleasing God to the best of their knowledge, but their knowledge doesn't have room for Christ. They need to know Christ. Neither is there salvation in any other. There is no other name under heaven given among men whereby you must be saved. Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man comes to the Father but by me. So dear friend, I don't know about you, but my heart breaks for Jewish folks that don't know the Savior. And in those times where I've had opportunity to witness to them, I am thankful for the ability to reach into the Old Testament and show them those hints, those clues, those prophecies of Jesus Christ. God had a plan. A practicing Jew has a very, very high view of Scripture. He agrees with our basic tenet of God said it, I believe it, that settles it. He has a biblical authority, and so show him in his Bible, which for us is Genesis to Malachi. There's is the same words, different order of books, but show them in their own Bible what was to come. It's a wonderful proof. Jesus was unique to history, and God did wonderful things by showing us these little hints that he had a plan all along. Heavenly Father, thank you for your word. Thank you, Lord, for the wonderful dovetail of Old Testament and New. Thank you, Lord, that 
Nothing is taking you by surprise. You are not captive to the will of and whim of man, but Lord, you are God, and as such, you are causal. As such, you make things happen. As such, you open hearts to believe. As such, you convict hearts of sin. And as such, you planned for our salvation. And you willingly gave up your one and only Son to die in our place. He that knew no sin became very sin for us so that we could be made God's righteousness in Christ. Lord, we're so thankful for that. As we delight in this season, Lord, may we be ever mindful of the price that was paid for us on Calvary that our thoughts wouldn't end at the cradle, but Lord, they would continue to the cross, that we would delight in your love for us and that we would delight, Lord, in the empty tomb above all, that final victory that you had over Satan through your son, crucified but risen. And Lord, we're so glad to know he's returning for us. We don't know what the next year brings. We don't know what's the next domino to fall in our world. But Lord, we know the end of the story we know that our Savior reigns, and we know that we'll reign with Him. Lord, may we be obedient toward Your Son, our Savior. We pray it in His name. Amen. Let's stand together as we sing the birthday of a king.